a Timberline family. Um, this is a third installment, third conversation with Dr. Doug Groteis. Uh, if you missed the previous ones, I would really encourage you to go back and listen to them. We talked about the problem of evil and um, many, many issues that I, that I think will be really interesting um, for you to listen to. But just a quick introduction. I've uh, done it more fully in the previous ones, but uh, Dr. Doug Groteis is professor of philosophy down at Denver Seminary. He's also the director of the ethics and apologetics program there. Uh, we've had him up at the Timberline community and CSU for some campus outreach events that we've done. Um, so he's a, he's a good friend of uh, us. I studied under him about 20 years ago uh, when I was working on my master's degree in philosophy of religion at, at Denver Seminary. So um, Dr. Groteis, thanks for taking some time to uh, be with us as a community. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, what I wanted to do was uh, just take a few minutes and talk about your most recent book. Uh, it's, it's called Walking Through Twilight, A Wife's Illness, A Philosopher's Lament. Um, can you give maybe just a brief overview of the experience that this book came out of and what you're, what you're kind of doing in the book? Yes, it's a memoir. And I really thought I would never write a memoir, but the way my life turned out, it seemed to be the right thing to do. It's really about uh, Rebecca and my journey through her dementia. Uh, Becky passed away about two years ago. The book came out in 2017 before she died. Uh, it, all, it all started when I wrote an article for Christianity Today about learning to lament, basically. And I was contacted by three publishers about making this into a book. And I was reluctant to do so, but then I realized that it might help some other people. And the way I am as a writer is that I often describe events I'm going through. So as I was writing this book about my experiences and reflecting on scripture, I found out that I had already written a lot of it in my mind before I sat down to write it on the keyboard. So it has to do with uh, learning that this brilliant woman that I married in 1984 had a terminal form of dementia called primary progressive aphasia that would take away her ability to speak and her ability to accomplish everyday tasks and would eventually kill her. So I take the form in the book of what's called a lament and I think some of you watching right now perhaps have read C.S. Lewis's book, A Grief Observed, where he laments the death of his wife, Joy Davidman, or perhaps you've read Michael Card's books about lament. And lament is a, a way of life. It has to do with really having deep sorrow over the struggles and tragedies of life. But biblically, a lament is where you take all that pain and hurt and frustration and sometimes anger to the Lord in prayer. And there are perhaps 60 psalms of lament out of our 150 psalms in the Old Testament. And the ultimate lament, the, the quintessential, the absolute lament is actually our Lord on the cross when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And that was a prayer. He was praying Psalm 22, which is a psalm of David, one of the great lament psalms. So what I wanted to do is to speak to this tragedy in biblical terms, the terms of lament. Do you think that um, Christians generally are good at lamenting? Do they know how to do it? Is it, is it, a, is it a lost skill? Mm -hmm. What's been your experience? No, I don't think American Christians are typically very skilled at suffering well. And Part of that is the American optimism, entrepreneurial spirit, can-do attitude. That's one of our strengths. But I think one of our weaknesses is that we often don't know how to face inescapable suffering with virtue, to find meaning in the midst of suffering that is not going to go away. Because we are people who want to solve problems. Everybody wants to solve problems. But 
one of the most ingenious, wise things about the Bible is that it teaches us how to suffer well, how to grieve well, and not to deny the harsh, difficult realities we face when a loved one gets a terminal illness or you lose a child, whatever it may be, in an accident. It actually tells us that it's all right to weep. It's all right, actually, to call out to heaven and say, um, how long, O oh Lord? How long will this go on? Or why did this happen? Or God, it seems like you're not holding true to the promises we have. And that might seem to be impious and rebellious, but if you're offering your cries, the cries of the heart to the Lord, then that's a lot better than just ignoring God. It's much better to be upset with God than just telling God, uh, leave me alone and I don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. So as I struggled, and as Becky struggled through this illness, I had already thought a lot about lament because Rebecca had been chronically ill for many years. And I had explored uh, the Psalms of Lament and the book of Ecclesiastes, which is not technically a lament, still helps us deal with the tragic side of life so wisely. So when Becky was diagnosed with this rare form of dementia back in 2014, uh, I had some resources theologically and existentially to bring to bear. That doesn't mean that I always suffered well. I often did not suffer well. But I tried to smelt and sculpt as much meaning as I could from her illness by caring for her, and speaking and writing a lot about lament, because lament is actually a gift from God for us in a fallen world. Uh, we don't, it's a gift nobody wants, but it's better to suffer well than suffer poorly. I've done both, and I can tell you, it's a lot better to suffer well and lament biblically than it is to go in the wrong direction. So the book is an attempt to show people through the prism of my life and the prism of Rebecca's life something about biblical lament, which always has hope. It's not simply complaining before God. It's voicing your deepest disappointments and deepest frustrations to God, uh, recognizing the fallenness of this world. And I think it's appropriate to lament certain things because if something was truly good and it's taken away, you don't want to say that it was nothing. Uh, Rebecca Merrill Grotheis, my first wife, was a member of Mensa. I mean, she was technically a genius. She had a genius IQ. She wrote two books. She co-edited a big academic volume. She was a brilliant woman. And then she gets a disease that takes away her ability to speak and think. So what could be more cruel than that? So I had to lament, and she had to lament that loss. But we can lament by realizing the Christian worldview. You've got creation. The world is very good. You've got the fall. Sin corrupts everything. And then we have redemption. So she had this brilliant intellect that's good by creation. She used it for God's glory. She was pained and disabled by what came out of the fall, this terrible disease. But we could find meaning in the midst of it, because Christ came, was completely good, died for us, rose again from the dead, ascended to heaven, and tells us that he will come again one day to make all things right. But that worldview has the fall as a constitutive element. I think sometimes Christians want to pretend like the fall never happened somehow, and uh, we can just be happy clappy and have a smile on our face all the time. And it's really not the right way to be. Uh, Ecclesiastes 3 says, there's a time for every purpose under heaven. There's a time to mourn, and there's a time to dance. So the wise person tries to figure out what time is it. Is it a time to mourn, or is it, is it a time to dance? One of the things you, you talk about in this memoir of yours is you talk about um, having times of rage, being angry. In fact, at one, at one place you you talk about even your thinking about God wasn't very clear. Uh, you wrote this. Um, you said, I hated God, 
and I told him so repeatedly. I hated myself for doing it, but I did it. Is there a, is there a place of, because you mentioned anger earlier, bringing everything to God, anger. Is it appropriate for a Christian to express their anger toward God? Is, is that ever appropriate in a devotional sense or? Yeah. Well, I don't advise hating God and I don't view myself as a example to be copied, but I do take heart in several things. First of all, that God is forgiving God and that it is much better for us and it brings God more glory and pleasure when we worship him. But I do find in scripture times when people who walk with God are very irate with God. You find this in some of the Psalms. You certainly find uh, Jonah very irate with God. Of course, he has to be corrected. And if we do rage at God, we should be corrected. That shouldn't be the, the normal way of dealing with God at all. But believing in the gospel and believing that Christ's sacrifice was sufficient for all of my sin, past, present, and future, uh, I come back to the fact that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. But certainly things like fits of rage are of the flesh, they're not of the spirit, and we should cultivate an attitude, a settled conviction of thanksgiving and, and praise and trust of God. But uh, this fallen world is very jagged and it beats us up and we're not completely sanctified. We're not completely Christ-like. So I think it's better to take all of that to God than try to live your life without him. And over the years, I, I've heard of so many people that have been disappointed with God. Philip Yancey wrote a good book on that years ago called Disappointment with God. And one response to disappointment with God is basically to give up on God. Just say, okay, I gave God a chance. Now I'm going to live my life on my own steam according to my own terms. I have just never been able to do that. <laughs> I have been very disappointed, very angry with God, but I'm a God-haunted man. You know, I, I just can't get away from God. I think about him. I reflect on scripture. The scripture is a part of me, and I have godly friends who bring me back to reality and so on. You know, I, I think about, um, I'm trying to think about some objections <laughs> that Christians might make to the idea of embracing lament. Um, what, what would you say to someone who's, you know, who says, you know, gosh, I look at the Old Testament Israelite people. And for instance, during their wandering times, it says that they grumbled against God. And they say, well, I mean, God clearly condemned that. How yep. is lament different than that concept of grumbling against God? That's a very good question, and I deal with it briefly in the book, probably inadequately, but I preached on Hebrews 3 recently, and that's one of the warning passages about the Israelites grumbling against God and losing hope and losing faith. So we're warned not to lose faith in God, to not weary God with grumbling and complaining and carping and so on. And I guess the way I would distinguish the two is that grumbling is where we're complaining about something that really should not be addressed. So for example, when the Israelites are wandering in the desert, they're complaining about the repetition of the manna when they should be thankful that they have anything to eat at all. And they should be thankful that God delivered them out of Egypt. But there are times when of uh, voicing your complaint or voicing your deep concern to God is very appropriate. Um, I'll go to Psalm 88. That's a Psalm of Heman the Ezraite. And when you read it, you see that he was chronically ill. And it's a prayer. But the end of the prayer is translated, darkness is my closest friend. So there's no resolution into praise or thanksgiving. Some translations put it, all my friends are in darkness. Either one is not a very happy picture. And that's a song. And then also in Psalm 39, which is a Psalm of David, David 
at the end basically says, God, you've caused me so much trouble. Please lighten up and just leave me alone for a while. That's my paraphrase. Go and read it in one of the authorized translations. But that does not resolve into praise or thanksgiving either. So that encourages me that we can take our deepest concerns to the Lord. Now, if we're just petty and peevish, which I often am, then I can't dignify that and call that a lament. But, you know, if I am struggling over taking my wife to the neurologist, taking Becky to the neurologist, and the neurologist clearly is inept, which happens several times, then I lament that. I say, Lord, we need help. We need a good doctor. This is hard. Now, I don't take that to be a pointless kind of peevishness. I think that's just the, that was probably the cry of my heart. Now, if I ended up uh, getting bitter about that person or not praying for that person or behaved in a sinful way, then I think it would go into just complaining. And maybe I'm still a little bit upset about that as I, as I voice that, but that's one of the struggles of caregivers for uh, the story of taking care of a very ill person is sometimes the medical professionals don't know what they're doing. And that just adds another layer of lament and struggle to the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, at uh, one point in the book, I don't remember where it was. I don't have it up in front of me, but you talk about that experience of sitting in a doctor's office and, and the doctor giving you information um, just going on and on, almost unaware that there are two deeply broken people sitting right in front of him, <clears throat> which made me think about how, how we as followers of Jesus um, respond to others when they are going through deep suffering, when there's confusion, disorientation of faith, whatever it might be. What are some things either that you've learned through this about responding to others who are suffering or advice you would give to Christians to say, hey, when you run into someone who's suffering, either, you know, here's a top five don't do list, <laughs> and here's some things to do. Well, let me start with some things not to do. And one is don't try to say it's not really so bad, because it is bad. Uh, if you've lost a loved one out of nowhere, sudden loss, that's bad. You're losing a loved one slowly, gradual loss, that's bad. So when we want to be with people and comfort them, we shouldn't try to tell them it could be a lot worse or it's not so bad. And then often we, don't, we shouldn't compare their suffering to our own. Many people will do that. I remember people learning about Becky's dementia and they'd say, yes, my, my 90 year old grandfather has dementia. Well, that's sad. But Rebecca was in her late 50s when she was diagnosed. So that's different. Uh, each person suffers in their own way. And I think we need to honor that. In fact, uh, there's a, a scripture that says that each heart knows its own bitterness and no one shares its joy. And the, uh, the great German psychiatrist, Viktor Frankl, who wrote about his experience in the death camps, said the same thing. We each suffer in our own way. So don't say it's not so bad. You probably don't want to compare it to what you have experienced. And the best thing to do is listen and be quiet. And in as much as you can be with the person. Now, obviously, in a pandemic, it's going to be more difficult to be there and to touch someone on the shoulder or something like that or wipe away their tears. But as much as we can to show concern through presence. And also not try to figure it out. Just say, this is hard, this is bad. Um, maybe talk about God's presence with them. But not say, well, you know, this happened because something a lot better is going to happen later. Just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's often good to just say nothing and be there and pray and be a loving presence with people. So is it, is it possible to even say things that are true, but not helpful? You know, the, well, hey, God works all things together for good. That's a true statement, right? Mm -hmm. But would wisdom say that's not the time to say it? <laughs> is there a time to mourn and a time to right. rejoice? And... Right. Well, scripture also says to 
laugh with those who laugh and weep with those who weep. So if it's a time to weep, you shouldn't be looking on the bright side. You should be mourning along with someone. And you're right, something can be true and it just not be the time to say it. It might be a time later to say it. Or say something else, something else that's true. Um, you know, I think of something like Psalm 23, that classic account of God being with us through the suffering. Yeah, it may not be the time to, to haul out Romans 8, 28. Yeah. What would you say to someone who, because um, I've, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people and um, brought up the need of laments and they're trying to just, you know, just get over it kind of thing. They've been told that, or, or maybe they've just put that on themselves. Um, if someone were to say, I don't even know how to, like wh what's involved in lamenting? Are there steps? Are there like ways I can learn how to lament? Where would you direct them? Hmm. Well, I guess I would go to biblical literature of lament, like many of the Psalms, Psalm 22, Psalm 88, Psalm 90 is my favorite Psalm of lament. It was written by Moses as a man who knew God profoundly. But a lot of that Psalm is saying how difficult life is. Uh, and he cries out uh, that God would give him some relief and that God would restore and renew because we've all suffered so tremendously. I'm paraphrasing, but he says, um, make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, as many years as we have seen sorrow. That's very raw, but yeah. it's Moses and it's in the scripture. So I think the Psalms can help shape our emotions and guide our prayers pretty profoundly, but that means we need to understand the Psalter to some extent. There's, there's Psalms of rejoicing, there's Psalms of lament, there are clearly Messianic Psalms and, um, when people are going through different things, I often try to refer them to particular psalms that could give comfort and encouragement. And I think uh, three of the major psalms of lament that I recommend for people suffering would be 22, 88, and 90. And there, there are many others, but a 90 is one that I actually have a chapter on in the book, Walking Through Twilight, because I think it's so profound. Wow. Well, I think it's good for people to think of. Um, you know, spiritual disciplines, um, celebration is a spiritual discipline. <laughs> but what I like what you've done in this book is you're also reframing, I think, I, I don't know if you would agree with this, but you're reframing lament is also, it's a spiritual discipline needed at certain seasons. Is that fair to say? Yes, yes. I think it's a mode of existence. It's a genre in literature. And it is appropriate often in this fallen world. And then the liturgical churches have a season of that called Lent, where we uh, really reflect on our sin and the sorrows of the world. But you don't have to observe Lent to understand how significant lament is in human existence. And then as followers of Jesus, who himself lamented over the unbelief of his people, we have the, the intellectual and existential resources to lament well to suffer well. Suffering is actually a skill to be learned, and nobody wants to learn it, but you can suffer well or suffer poorly, and I guess what I'm trying to do in the book is show some ways not to suffer and some better ways of offering your sorrows to God. I also recommend Michael Card's books. He's written two books on lament. One of them is called A Sacred Sorrow, and there is Nicholas Wolterstorff's book called Lament for a Son. He lost his young son to a climbing accident. And there's C.S. Lewis's pretty well-known book called um, A Grief Observed. So those might help people uh, who have not lamented enough. In America, we tend to say, let's move on. It's time for something new. But you can't. Yes, sometimes people need to be prodded a little bit. Come on, get out of the house. Um, give away your, your departed wife's clothes now. All right. Sometimes we need that. But uh, sometimes we actually just need to slow down and grieve well and give ourselves some room and give our friends some room 
to grieve, to grieve well. Yeah. Um, maybe to kind of wrap this up, uh, I don't want to say end on a end on a high note, but <laughs> um, why is it that you don't call you or you do call your book Walking Through Twilight? And you've talked before a little bit about, you know, why walking through twilight? Why not walking through darkness? Yeah. Well, originally I had come up with a title that had the word darkness in it. And I realized, no, it's, you know, we're walking into the twilight and there'll be a sunset when Becky passes away, but there will also be a sunrise when she rises again from the dead. So it, it was never totally dark because God was always with us. And even uh, when Becky breathed her last breath and I was there with her, she was immediately in the presence of her Lord and Savior. Hmm. I love that. That's hopeful. Well, any, um, any other just last thoughts or comments that you would give to the Timberline community? Uh, for, for certain, there I know many, many people who have lost loved ones recently, um, are going through difficult times, and um, any just encouragement you would give them or last words you would say to them of hope? Yeah. Cling to Christ, the one who died for our sins and rose again from the dead to defeat sin and death, and he's coming again, and he's with us always. So we can take heart we can experience the worst that life has to offer and not become bitter we can grieve well with the lord and we can have hope uh, many of the things in this life that are difficult will be resolved in this life at least temporarily many of those who get coronavirus will recover and will rejoice with them some won't but one way or the other uh, god will have his way with his people. We can count on that. Amen. Amen. That's good. Dr. Groteis, thank you again just for taking this time. I, I, I highly encourage everyone listening to pick this book up. If, if this is not a season of lament in your life, um, you know, like was said, the, it's a skill and we need to learn how to do it. So maybe it's better to learn how to do it before you're in that season. <laughs> uh, thanks again for taking the time and being with us. We really, really appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. Thank you.